Right, thanks to everyone for coming. It's a pretty good turnout, really, so thanks for your time. So I'm Gus Pickering um, from NV Interactive. Um, so we're a web design agency with 20-something uh, staff, and uh, we've recently gotten into the Windows 8 app space. So um, I'm here with a couple of others from my team. And I'm going to start off by giving a bit of a background of um, the apps that we've built um, so far. So this is uh, more of a real-world learning um, experience, so giving you tips from real apps that we've built. Um, we're not building a sample app. There are other sessions that do that. So hopefully there'll be some useful takeaways. So uh, Sam, who's a senior designer at NV, he's going to talk about his uh, background um, in uh, <coughs> building websites in HTML5 and how it all translates to the uh, new Windows 8 world. And Zach, uh, developer, will uh, talk about the transition to JavaScript. And let's get started. So, as with any uh, new undertaking, uh, training is pretty important. So. Um, Quite simply, we attended the Windows 8 camp, which uh, Microsoft runs in New Zealand. And it was invaluable. It gave us a whole lot of uh, resources and pointers to get started. Because um, there are quite a few new concepts in Windows 8, and um, <coughs> especially building apps um, for Windows 8 is, is quite different to uh, building websites. So the first project I'm going to talk to you about is the New Zealand Cricket. Um, app. So they're a long-standing client of ours. We have built their website and run their live scoring system, uh, have for many years. And uh, we managed to get the app into the store, one of the first in New Zealand, for the release candidate store um, back in May. So slightly uh, bigger example app, which um, uh, the guys will talk about in some detail, is uh, ESPN Crick Info. So our <coughs> history with them is um, quite interesting. So we built the live scoring system for Crick Info many, many years ago. Uh, I think it's 2005. And so that's still driving the, the uh, live scoring on Crick Info now. So we, we actually uh, had a business trip over to London. And uh, really, we were just catching up, um, not really expecting too much, so it started with a conversation in a pub, which is uh, pretty pretty normal for London, and came up that they were looking at engaging a, an agency, quite a big agency, to build a Windows 8 app. So we had already undertaken uh, the design for the New Zealand Cricket app, so we had a design document which I proceeded to show them on my phone. So we secured a meeting the next day, we had about 20 minutes before flying to the airport, talked to the right people, and uh, thought nothing of it, flew, flew away, and as soon as we touched down in uh, Shanghai, uh, we got an email telling us the good news. So, awesome opportunity for the company, and uh, hopefully you think we've done a good job. So, this is in the store now, and there's an update coming soon, um, but we got that out, in, that out in August. So, with the New Zealand cricket, uh, build. We work closely with Microsoft in New Zealand, and we work closely with Microsoft in the UK for ESPN. So, uh, part of the process was what was called the Application Experience Review, or AER. So, this is an internal process uh, that Microsoft uh, puts uh, some of the early apps through, which was really useful for helping to ensure consistency amongst the apps and that people understand the Windows 8 design language um, and ensure quality of the apps going into the store. So we learned a lot from that and uh, we'll refer to the, that process a little bit later. So I am going to be brave and use the conference Wi-Fi to do a demo. So please bear with me. Probably the other thing to explain is the resolution's rubbish, so just please be with us. So this is the New Zealand Cricket app. 
So it gives a reasonable sh snapshot of cricket within New Zealand. So uh, we base it around the series concept. So obviously New Zealand's in India. And um, we'll just have a bit of a look in here. So we bring in the latest news, use photography, which is a very common uh, concept you'll see in a lot of these Windows 8 apps. And if we go across, um, you'll see the next match is scheduled. So I can't really control the uh, match schedule, so normally that would be replaced with a live match, which is probably one of the main uses for the, for the app. The other thing to point out, this resolution, you can't snap, but otherwise you could quite easily snap uh, the live scoring over to the side and get on with your, your real work. We also bring in uh, the overall results, and we link back to the website, which may or may not work. Yep. And uh, so we can get into the full scorecard. So we weren't trying to reproduce the website. We were just trying to give a pretty uh, sort of uh, match and results sort of centric app that we think fans will hopefully like. So the great thing about Windows apps is that you aren't, res aren't necessarily responsible to reproduce the website. And that's a really important thing to remember. It can be quite focused. And that's where uh, I think the good apps do well. And uh, I won't bore you with domestic cricket, but there's uh, gives you a bit of an overview of results by using colour and things like that. Uh, this app also has push notifications, so you can turn uh, on and off wicket alerts. Um, so we use Azure to back that. Right, so let's get back to our start, and hopefully you'll find this a little bit more interesting. Um, this is what is currently available in the store, which anyone uh, can download that's running Windows 8 now. So on the uh, main hub here, we surface uh, quite a bit of content. Again, we weren't forced to follow the website um, information architecture or anything like that. We uh, designed it based around what users uh, wanted to see. So we bring in a whole bunch of news um, and some match information. So we we'll use uh, some cricket in the UK, which is currently in progress. Um, so it's the end of, end of day one. And uh, you can see the scorecode. Uh, it's got a lean back mode, which uh, really would benefit from a widescreen, but we won't go there. Also, commentary. Um, so you can go back, and red is um, there to indicate a wicket. And full scorecard. So, some interesting design uh, challenges here, which uh, Sam will uh, touch on, um, but to be able to scroll in both directions is a bit of a no-no unless you use tricks like a pop-up like this. Okay, so let's go back to see some... So the, the hub pages um, bring in um, some extra uh, content. So this is, uh, shows current series, recently finished, etc. Back and the conference Wi Fi is very slow. So let's uh, try forcing the issue. Anyway, I think everyone gets the basic idea of the app, so why don't we just carry on? Oh, there we go. Okay, so one of the first decisions uh, that anyone making Windows 8 apps really needs to make is whether they're going the HTML5 or XAML route. So for NV, we're a web design agency, so uh, we build websites. Uh, we build using Microsoft technologies, so ASP.NET, SQL Server, um, but probably more importantly, uh, an HTML5. Uh, we do have XAML experience, so I think we made a balanced decision. Um, so we've done a little bit of Silverlight, a uh, bit of WPF apps, um, and uh, Phone 7. So. Um, so what we really looked at, though, is how we can scale that side of the business. So um, for us, our existing workflow, which works really well, is we have designers who work in Photoshop. They create the concepts. Uh, we have front-end developers, which will do the CSS, HTML, and uh, these days more and more JavaScript and jQuery. So at NV, we're quite lucky with the fact that our designers are all currently front-end developers as well. So we really get that attention to detail in the UI and the interaction. 
Okay, and then there's the developers. So the developers do what normal developers do. They uh, build the uh, back end, so web services and SQL Server and all that fun stuff. So looking at uh, what we currently had and what we needed, um, it was actually a pretty simple decision. So <clears throat> for, to get our designers up to speed, they need to learn the Windows 8 design language, um, which the training camp was really good for, to be, to be honest. Uh, and for developers, they needed to learn JavaScript. So again, uh, Zach and Sam will touch on their experiences there. So now that we've got this work, uh, we need to do it. Um, so being a new technology, uh, Windows 8, uh, you may need to educate your clients. So this is again where we found the AER process really useful because it helped justify our design decisions and it gave us something to back up um, why we did something a particular way. So if you ever have the opportunity to go through that process, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, it may seem obvious, but delivering prototypes to clients is really important. So, again, being uh, reasonably new, not uh, all clients will have access to devices. And I'm not sure about your businesses, but you generally don't give your clients uh, tablets to, just to play on. So, we, um, to, to get around that, we were lucky with ESPN. Uh, they did have uh, one device that they could uh, handle um, our builds with and test them, but uh, it didn't go wider than that. So ESPN's a big company, um, so we needed to distribute it to management all around the world. So uh, we did screen captures, so Expression Encoder is uh, a free way to do that, and it worked really well. Uh, the other thing we found is uh, store pa passing through the store is not necessarily uh, granted. For, for little things, uh, we we did um, have a good run with uh, New Zealand Cricket, but with this uh, ESPN app, uh, we didn't have a, a privacy policy in the app, so we failed. And uh, you also need to include a, include a support um, email address. And um, the other little tip I can give you is make sure you get your age rating right, um, unless there's a good reason. Uh, I'd use uh, 7 plus. And uh, finally, uh, don't ever forget about an app that does get submitted. Um, they are going to stick around forever. You can't force uh, people to up update your apps. So if there are bugs, they could remain for quite some time. So along similar lines, don't forget about your services. Don't change your services underneath an existing app, otherwise you'll cause that to fail as well. So. Um, that, that sort of covers off uh, the business side of things, so I really think it's time we uh, bring up uh, Mr. Sam Langley, who will talk about our design experience. Thank you. Just, uh, thank you very much, Gus. And uh, what a turnout this is. There's standing room only. This is, this is highly unexpected. But thanks, everybody, for, for coming along. So I'm a designer, so I like white backgrounds, fan. It's on, but um, it hasn't been turned up. Well, it's on my chest anyway. In the meantime, I'll just sort of wave to everybody down in the corners down there and, uh, and all the way down there as well. Still not going? The tech guy looks, uh, he's got a serious look on his face at the moment. <laughs> Hello? Hello? <laughs> I'll take Gus's, Gus's microphone. Okay, just... This is good, this is eating into my time, so, uh, so I'll go through things quickly once I, once I get up there. Okay, have we got action on this one? Okay, I'm going to keep talking, I'm going to keep talking until, until you guys hear something. I haven't got any stories to tell, so I'll just have to keep on, keep on blabbering on and shaking of heads from these guys. I'm a quiet talker, so probably you guys in the corner really can't hear a thing down there either. Anything at all? What do you, uh, do you want me to turn it up on the... Is it, how about now? 
Battery's good. Whoa, hello everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, I'll be here all week. <laughs> okay, where was I? I'm, I'm a designer. My name's Sam. Um, got quite a lot of experience in web design and as Gus mentioned, I also like to, to pretend that I'm a front-end developer as well, so I tend to get my hands dirty with a bit of JavaScript and, uh, and all sorts of other languages that I shouldn't really touch at all. So basically, I'm a web guy, and what does that mean in the real world these days? <laughs> I love that picture. It's, it's, it's an old one, but it's, it's, it's quite a good one. And uh, we'll just actually talk about what it really means to be a web guy, and that means that I design and build websites. And I've been designing and building websites for a while, and what I didn't expect was that I would one day be designing and building websites and apps. And that's mainly because the well, I decided that, that uh, I'd throw my weight into websites, into HTML, and that's, that's where I thought it was at. And uh, probably pre, prior to Windows 8, I would have, in, a, in an argument, in a discussion about uh, apps versus websites, I would, have, I would have cited with websites every day. And uh, that apps have a place, but um, I'd prefer to be doing websites. But I find myself building apps, and uh, since I actually just like to build things in HTML, I'm actually really enjoying it. And uh, so now the argument, I'm not so sure. I think I'd probably side with well, it depends on how drunk I am. I think I'd probably go with, with apps tonight. So designing and building apps, um, our team of designers were involved at, um, and the design side were involved in the information architecture, user experience, um, documentation, and interface design, of course. So, you know, it's Photoshop work. It's pushing pixels around, and we enjoy that a lot. And then we have the, uh, the fun time of building what we design as well. So we code HTML and um, JavaScript and a lot of CSS, and we also do the interaction uh, coding as well. So there's, there, is a, there is a sort of a, um, a blurry line between where interaction design finishes and where the, uh, where the developers start, but you know, we tend to fight about. So these are some of the things that, um, that we designers at NV put together. This is, uh, this is stuff from the Crick Info documentation. Uh, Gus mentioned the AER review, and so this is this is the first round of documentation that we sent through to um, the AER team at Microsoft. It was really nice of Crick Info to let us, uh, let us show you guys these. So we do a bit of UX, we do a bit of, um, well this is, this is early stuff uh, from the interaction design. And, uh, there's been some talk about, um, and, and Nigel's talk and, uh, and Gus mentioned it about vertical scrolling. And so this was our, well, it's hard to see there, but this is our first attempt at how to handle that. And then some interface designs, and then we do a bit of this which looks surprisingly like HTML, really, because it is. And that's what you end up with, an app that tells you that New Zealand lost to India again in the test. And so this is a sort of a bit of a conversation about how I went from a web guy to an app guy and how the other designers in our team are going from web guys to app guys. And probably the, the, the fun thing from, from my point of view is that um, it, was, it was an easy transition. The, um, everything that I learned uh, being a web designer applied equally to, to being an app designer as well. And we found that Windows 8, ar Windows 8 architecture is similar to modern web apps that um, uh, Twitter and Facebook, they, they work as, uh, as one-page apps. They, um, they use JavaScript to, uh, to, to dynamically load an HTML and sort of control the, uh, the user experience. There's, there's not a lot of actual pure web page requests. So Windows 8 apps work a lot like that. And that as a web designer, web developer, your workflow will change, but it's not, it won't change a lot. Um, most of the tools that I used before I still use. I still use Photoshop, I still use Dreamweaver sometimes for, for CSS, although that's getting less and less. And I used to use a lot of Visual Studio and I just use it even more. Of course, the, the big change is that you'll have to develop and design on Windows 8 because, because it uses uh, Explorer 10 and Explorer 10 only works on, on Windows 8 which means there's no more browser compatibility issues than for a web designer. This is, this is big. This, this, is, this is a game changer, really, from our point of view. Because, I mean, as much as we enjoy troubleshooting, <laughs> we don't really enjoy it. Well, around the office, I was kind of like the go-to guy for the compatibility, so, you know, I sort of know more of that. Phew. It's all IE 10. Which also means that if it works on my machine, then it's going to work for everyone else as well. There's probably going to be a few caveats to that, but I think 95% yeah, of the time that's going to be true. What you're using is what everybody else is going to be using, so you don't have to do so much compatibility testing. You don't have to have 
you have to have devices around because you do need to try different form factors and touch, but you don't have to have different operating systems, you don't have to have different browsers and all the different versions and things. It just means that it's, it's a lot smoother. But even though Windows 8 apps are built using the same technology, they're not websites, but they're a lot like websites. They're like websites, but without the compromises. You don't have to worry about bandwidth. You don't have to worry about, um, you don't have to worry so much about, um, well, there's a different kind of asset management. You don't have to worry about um, all of the legacy design stuff that's going on. They're like a, they're like a website, uh, but starting again, you get to sort of, um, you get to sort of start with a clean sheet of paper and uh, and and you know, take uh, take existing web contents and uh, and then repurpose it the, the way that maybe you thought it should have been in the first place. Oh, it's a design language formerly known as Metro, or now known as the Windows UI design language. So I'm going to go through this reasonably quickly because it's been covered by uh, by other guys today in different sessions and other sessions. But it's sort of it's just some of my my sort of thoughts on on the Windows UI design language and turn. So if you're going to start making Windows apps, the first thing you need to do is you need to learn the language. You need to you need to use Windows. You need to um, you need to have it installed on your machine and be using it just as a, as an average user. You need to actually become fluent in it before you can even start thinking about designing it. So I mean, I, I installed the first preview release. Uh, I think it was back in November last year on, on one of my home machines, and so I've been using it for a long time. And we've installed every every release since then. And then at the office, probably since uh, since maybe was it February February this year, we've actually been using it on our primary development machines. And so we've been sort of you know really jumping in head first. And remember that um, that that Windows UI, and Windows 8 apps, they put users first. I mean, it's, it's the whole thing about getting getting the Chrome out of the way, getting all of the sort of the, uh, the the embellishments out of the way, and actually letting people do what they want to do. And so it means you have to really know your content and know your users. You have to do your research. So get to know your content really, really well. Become a subject matter expert on uh, on the, the, the content that you that you that you're dealing with. Just remember that, um, that a lot of this is coming from the fact that we have uh, been a web design house for a long time, and our clients, our, our Windows 8 apps, tend to be uh, the same content that we've built websites for. So I mean, this is stuff that uh, that we've had to sort of go through. If, if you're designing an app, which is which is more of a tool, it's probably it's probably a different story. Although it's still just as important to, to, to put your user first, but um, you know, your content is a different story. Then we we deal with apps that deal with content. Windows 8, Windows UI is all about the grid, but use the grid wisely. Know how the grid works, but um, but you know don't be a slave to the grid. And good typography is a very powerful weapon in the right hands. And modern web, I mean, we've been contrasting websites and app design, but they sort of do share the same DNA these days. We tend to set up some straw man arguments with uh, with. With modern, well, with older websites and modern app design, to sort of make the differences look more different. But uh, but modern web design is actually close to app design, and app design shares a lot of the same background as modern web design. So uh, I was going to show. Well, actually, here's here's uh, the, the Microsoft uh, um, library website, which is sort of they're bringing the Windows UI stuff into the website. And then it's the store, which is kind of like your your, your reference level Windows 8 app. It's sort of it's, it's everything that um, that sort of by the book Windows 8 app design. And there's similarities, there's differences. I mean, uh, other people have talked about how you've got you've got navigation across the top. You've got a search box, which really shouldn't be there in an app because you have to. You know, you've got things like the unified search, which you can lean on there as well. So there's 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 um, there are differences, but um, yeah, there's a lot of similarities as well. So I'm going to go through some of the design principles and just try, try to comment on them quite quickly without getting into too much detail. So the grid is fundamental to Windows 8, uh, Windows UI design. So you, you use the grid to organize your information. And there's different ways to, to, um, to apply a grid. Um, you don't have to just draw boxes on screen and arrange them. You can, you can sort of have an, an underlying grid there, and it can be expressed in different ways um, that's, that you know are there and that inform the way that you actually lay things out, but they don't actually have to be explicitly put onto the page. And you can use color and size and proximity and shape. There's, there's all these different sort of um, design principles uh, in play here, and sort of gestalt closures and things like that. But it just means that's. It doesn't have to look like boxes on the page, although the first wave of apps are generally 
looking like boxes on a page. And we're, we're now trying to sort of get away from that in our designs. Since we've learnt the, uh, the language and we've done it sort of the, uh, by the book way, now we're starting to try and sort of push the boundaries a little. But it's not just a sort of a visual, physical grid. It's um, uh, the idea of a grid also, it also informs how you think about um, user interaction and how you arrange information. It's basically you want, to, you want to have internal consistency inside your app. You want people to do the same things in different places, but in the same way, so that there's no surprises. Because nothing frustrates people more than, than trying, to, trying to perform the same task, but it's, it's performed differently in different places. So you need to actually, internal consistency helps with that. And it, gives, it keeps users in the flow because they're not relearning things as they go through. It applies to UX and, and uh, it applies to information as well. And so that's just an idea of closure that, um, that the brain will actually fill in the gaps. I mean, the, most of you out there, I'm sure, will see a circle, even though there's actually only about 40% of a circle on the, on the page there. So the grid doesn't have to be there for people to actually respond to it. A few words about interaction. Um, animation and, and Windows and good Windows UI design. Animation is, is pretty much it's essential. It doesn't. It's not just an eye candy. It's not just sort of uh, frilly, happy stuff that um, that sort of makes people feel good. It's actually it, it helps to enhance comprehension. It's, um, it'll draw connections between between uh, disparate things on the page. If you can just sort of show a little bit of animation, suggest movement in the direction of the next thing, it, it, it helps guide people to, to where they're going. But you do need to keep it simple. You, and to keep it simple, you need to be clever with your animation. You've got to know when to back off, and you've got to know when to sort of actually push forward and just remember that any animation that you use has to be fast because as soon as it starts stuttering and slowing down then people are going to get pulled out of the flow, they're going to get frustrated and they're going to sort of, um, it's going to sort of ruin the experience. And try to delight your users, try to sort of put something in there which, um, which makes them go, wow, and they sort of just, they'll just pop their eyes open and it'll make them feel good about it and if they feel good about it then then they're going to tell their friends, and then their friends will tell their friends, and you'll make a million dollars. Information architecture. Um, because a web app, I'll go over this way for a little while and talk off this one. A web app is not a website, so it's key to sort of stay on task. It's key to keep your information architecture simple, but that can be hard. And keeping things simple is not easy. It's actually really hard to make the simple. It's, it's the decisions that you've had to make along the way, especially when you're dealing with clients who want the whole of their website to be inside the app, and you've got to kind of push back and say which bits are essential and which, bit, which bits have to be taken out. So be prepared to make the hard cuts. And then whatever you do, validate your IA with subject matter experts. Make sure that, um, that people who know what you're, you know, what you're trying to do say that it's, that it's in the right direction because you can make what you think are genius design decisions and then somebody who's a cricket fan comes along and says no. And that's happened a lot. Uh, so use animation to enhance the experience. No matter how big you make a hit area, make it a little bit bigger again because you're designing or you're building probably, unless you're Nigel Parker, on a, um, on a desktop machine with a, with a keyboard and a mouse. And so you're, you're in that mode of using a, using a mouse, using fine precision pointers. As soon as you shift that to a, to a touch device and you use your big chubby fingers, then it's, um, it never feels big enough. Um, snap to view is important. It's, um, remember that uh, snap to view is there for a start. Because again, when you're designing the stuff, it's snap to view is kind of it's out, out, of, um, out of sight, out of mind. But um, it, people are going to use snap to view a lot. And it's quite, oh, Nigel's down there as well. <laughs> Shout out to Nigel. Snap to view, um, people are going to use it. Uh, so think about it very early on in the process, how the things that you're trying to present to users, you can also present when their attention is, is elsewhere on the page. Uh, and don't forget about portrait mode. Portrait mode is, uh, is really useful, especially when you're dealing with, uh, with a lot of content that's better laid out vertically. So um, as much as we like our, our article pages that have got uh, columns of text, I'd still prefer to actually turn the slate um, into portrait mode, get the, all the text just flow into one column. And, uh, and, and uh, I, I enjoy reading it that way more. And semantic zoom is a really useful tool. There's a million things you can do with semantic zoom. It's, it's, um, it's just like zooming on steroids. And uh, I think we've only really just scraped the, uh, the surface of, um, of the, how useful it can be. So this is a, this is a page from our CrickInfo AER document again. This is sort of design stuff. And as you can see, that, uh, there's a couple of snapped views in there. There's, um, there's a semantic zoom down the bottom, and uh, in the middle is a big 
big thought on the portrait stuff. This has changed since this, since it was built, but uh, we were we were thinking about how to how to do these, how to solve these problems, and how to approach these design scenarios. We're we're thinking about it quite early on in the, in the design process. Um, just a few more things about the design stuff. Um, designing within constraints for design is, is actually quite enjoyable. If you're presented with a white page, it's, um, it's sometimes, sometimes quite daunting and you don't know where to start. So the, the fact that uh, Microsoft has given us a really strong set of guidelines is, is actually quite, is quite fun. But um, within that, you can be bold, you can use lots of color, you can use contrast and, uh, and use sight really quite powerfully to, to, get things, to get things to look dynamic and engaging. And then you have to understand the rules, so then you can start to bend them, break them, and, uh, and sort of add your own unique touch to stuff without alienating users, without getting them to, to, them to relearn what they're already using. Quick words about panning. We've talked about it lots. Horizontal is really good, but it, there are always going to be times where you need to deal with vertical. It's just difficult. And Gus showed you these and portraits, and that's just, uh, I was talking about the article page before, and that's, that's quickly what it looks like for anybody who hasn't seen the app. We've talked about being authentically digital, and we haven't really talked about, well, I haven't heard today anyway, um, anybody sort of talk about the, the opposite side of that, uh, that coin, which is skeuomorphism, skeuomorphism, which is not explained that clearly in that quote there. But it's in a, in a design sense, in a, in a digital design sense, it's basically making things look like real objects. It's, it's textures and it's, it's mimicking stuff that you find in the real world. I think the, the fact that I highlighted ornamental design cues, it really is. It, I, was, I was trying to think of other examples, and um, there was a bunch on the Wikipedia site, but the one that I quite like is, is plastic alloy wheels that just snap in over the top of your steel wheels. They're useless, but they just make people feel better about the stuff. There's two interesting examples. One on the left was a much maligned podcasting reader from an unnamed company called Apple. And it's probably, in my opinion at least, a skeuomorphism gone. It's, it's gone to its logical extreme. I mean, it's a real-to-real it's -real tape machine. So it's, it's just weird. Podcasts are an inherently digital thing, and yet they're using a real-to-real -real tape machine to sort of uh, to, to represent them on a, on a, a digital device with a rabbit and a turtle, which I know are sort of uh, their old school Apple techniques for showing slower and faster, but I mean, so much wasted metaphor for a few very simple things, which is I want to play my podcast. It's just, it's just a very strange thing. People love it, though, because the, the attention to detail in there is, is just clear. That it wears it on its sleeve really strongly, and there, there is a lot of work that goes onto this, but in, in, in my opinion, it's kind of lazy work. It's sort of, it's, it's, there's not a lot of creativity goes into thinking of this interface, it's all the hard work is actually in the execution. I think it's, it's much harder to actually come up with a new way of, 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 of doing this one that actually can let people do things that they didn't think were possible before. I mean, that, that, that just does what you expect. It plays and it pauses and does some rewinding and things. The calculator on the right is, is a, a, a more of an interesting skeuomorphic um, problem because it's, it's, a digital, it's a digital interface. It's not trying to be a real world interface, but it's modeling it basically functions exactly the same as a, as a handheld calculator, which again isn't taking advantage at all of the potential of, uh, of the digital medium. Um, I think that one's actually got multi-lines, but the early calculators, there was a single line. So as soon as you hit the plus key, the last, the last line of uh, numerals was gone, which is just crazy. You've got all of this real estate, and you're doing things in exactly the same way that they were done before. I mean, the digital calculator has like 12 characters on an LCD display, it had very real physical constraints. We don't have those, but yet we're binding ourselves by the same physical constraints. Not a good idea. It does offer a shallow learning curve for users, but it also means that their learning curve tops out pretty quickly. It doesn't let them go much deeper than that. Um, you're modeling the physical constraints, and it's a bit of a lazy option. So it's, I just offered it as kind of the, the alternative to, to um, well, as the other side of the, uh, the being authentically digital story. <coughs> and so that if you are being authentically digital, it's not just flat colors. It's not just sort of nice, nice clean pixels and square edges. It's actually sort of using, using the medium to its full potential and uh, doing things in ways that, that were never possible in, in the physical world. Um, I mean, you can fold up um, spatial dimensions into, into your interface that, that just don't exist. 
I don't know how the hell you do it, but apparently you can. But just also remember that sometimes a button needs to be a big, shiny, tasty, lickable button that somebody wants to push. And usually when it's install your app for five dollars, you want that one to be pushed. So my first response to No, I'm going to backtrack there. Responsive web design is kind of the new hotness in, uh, in, in the, the web design world. Responsive web design just basically means um, you, you build one interface and it, um, it, it moulds itself into the, into the device that you're viewing it on. So if it's on a big screen, then it's, you've got plenty of space and things are spaced down, gradually smaller to, uh, to the point where it's a, um, it's a mobile device which is narrow but emphasis on the vertical. It's, it's a very powerful idea, and it's sort of simply, it's simply explained, and it's very, very hard to do. Responsive web design, the first time I saw, well, when I started diving into uh, Windows 8 apps, what I realized is that it's actually responsive app design as well, is that your app has to, it has to work on small sort of uh, tablet-sized devices. I'm cutting out, and I'm back again. Up to desktop machines with a, uh, with a mouse and keyboard and a cool set of little speakers, and big ass TVs. And you've got the different dimensions, and I've got no idea, it's lots and lots. It's, apparently it's about 4K across, about 2K high, something like that, I think. We do it using media queries, and we do it using CSS and media queries, and a media query looks like this, which basically says that, um, I'm going to start pointing to the screen. I'm sorry for, for everybody who can't really see here, but uh, what, what happens inside these curly braces only gets applied to, um, to the page, to the, to the interface when it's in the snap state. There's lots of different things you can, you can test for. You can test to, to see if your page is in portrait mode, is in landscape. You can test for minimum sizes, maximum sizes. Uh, you can also test for, for, for a DPI, um, for color depth, and a few other things as well. The DPI one's actually quite important because when you're getting into high resolution devices, but um, on physically small screens, you effectively you know, the equivalent of retina displays, um, high DPI displays, you need to supply high resolution assets. And so you need to know that you're in a, in a high DPI environment to make sure that your assets are actually gonna be displayed properly. You can also do a little bit of um, rudimentary Boolean stuff in there. So um, if, if it's not snapped, uh, apply the CSS, which, uh, which is quite useful as well. So here's the, uh, um, Gus called it the lean back mode, and, which actually does work. You don't have to be leaning back, but um, we, we've tried it out propping up the tablet next to a TV that we're actually watching. It's quite nice to have the scores there and good to be able to see it. I, I prefer a 10 foot interface myself. Um, it's the, media queries are, are, are good when they get out of the way and do the job without actually calling attention to themselves. So this, this interface scales really quite nicely. Not perfectly, I think when Gus was demoing it on, the, um, on that resolution it was a little bit cramped, but it was still usable. And so you can see between uh, 1080 display and then the tablet size 1366, 768, and then tablet portrait. It looks basically the same, but there, there are a number of little subtle changes in, at, um, at, at work here that, um, that, that uh, media queries are taking care of that uh, to the user they won't, probably won't even see it because to them it's just, a, it's just an interface that looks tailored to their device. But to us, we had to put hard work into actually testing it in different screen sizes to make sure that everything came out smooth. And of course, there's, uh, until you get real data in there, you don't even know how long team names are going to be, what, uh, what the maximum size of the score could be in different conditions. So there's a lot of, a lot of factors there. Uh, a few things you can see sort of are the text size is slightly reduced and stuff starts to wrap onto multiple lines. But um, it's, it's basically, it just does the job and gets out of the way without calling attention to yourself, but to users it means that they feel like they're actually being catered to. And also the nice thing is that it makes the browser do the hard work. You don't have to do any of this programmatically. You don't have to execute any, execute any JavaScript when the view state changes or when the resolution changes. It just happens. The, the browser takes care of it all for you, which means that um, you've got a, a better separation of presentation from logic. But by itself, media queries need to actually have a layout system to work. I'm just going to check my time as well and see if I race through this a bit quicker. So the, the, the cool layout stuff that, um, that Explorer 10 has, and since Explorer 10 is the, uh, is the rendering engine for Windows 8 apps, um, they're, they're available for us to use. 
Some of them have been in some other modern browsers, but um, there's different implementations because uh, standards not being finalized and things, but we're dealing with one browser, we can use them. So um, grid layouts are very powerful. They're kind of like the, the better version of what we used to use. We used to use tables back in the day to, to, as, a, as, a, as a grid layout and tables. There was a lot of restrictions. Grids, so sort of the same kind of theory, but really, really nicely done. So we can set up a grid, we can give it some rows and some columns, and then we can place some, some, uh, some HTML content into spots on the grid, which is really nice. And then we can scale the grid, and some, some squares stay fixed in size, and some squares will, will scale. But what's actually quite nice is that, um, is that this, this doesn't have any correlation to the source order of the HTML. So it means that um, we don't have to do any DOM manipulation if we wanted to actually change the way that the grid presents the, uh, the content to the user. So you go from, uh, from horizontal to portrait, you can, you can rearrange things without actually having to do any DOM manipulation. My favorite is, uh, is the flex box, which means it's, it's uh, just like grid was like tables done the right way, flex boxes like floats done the right way. And anybody who's a web designer out here has probably had to try and wrangle floats into, uh, uh, to do what uh, you want them to do. A flex box gives you all of the, uh, the, the power of, of floats with none of the, the, the hassles. So by default, elements uh, stack up vertically. As soon as you apply flex box to, uh, to the parent element, they, they, they flow horizontally or vertically if you want, which seems a bit redundant until you realize that you can actually justify them within the parent container, which is effectively it's uh, distributing them vertically, which makes more sense when we have different size boxes with uh, even spaces between each of the boxes. And as the box changes size, then they move as well. Now, when you're dealing with different size screens, that means that you can fill the height of your screen without actually having to do any, any programming. Because this, this is the kind of stuff that um, before Flexboxes was, was in the not very trivial bin. It, uh, it meant you actually had to start scratching your head and coming up with, a, with JavaScript to handle it for you. You had to find somebody else who'd done it, who'd solved the problem. And it didn't, tended to get put in the too hard bin. This is very, very good. So source order isn't important anymore, which means less DOM manipulation, which means better performance. And so we use flex boxes all over the place. We use it to lay out our, our panoramas horizontally. And then within elements, we use flex boxes as well. And you can see how that one's actually filled the available space vertically. This is, this is one of my favorites because um, I'm just, you know, I worked hard on the, uh, on the, uh, the article layout. And, um, and now I'll show you actually that it wasn't that hard. So you take a block of text. And you can just split it into columns, just, just one very, very easy CSS um, declaration. Or you can specify a column width, and it's just going to, 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 um, to split them into columns that wide. But the nice thing in, um, in IE10 is with a little bit of finessing and uh, some, some just setting up the initial conditions, you can pour more content in, and then your box is just going to keep, um, keep flowing out um, with four columns. It means that um, just getting it a, getting a, getting a started is, is quite easy, and then you can just pour text into your boxes, and it just gets handled really nicely, like that. And then exclusions are really, really cool as well. So then your columns of text drop an element over the top, a little bit of finessing, and then the text just wraps around it with very little, little effort. And so we use those in a few places as well. We actually use them in a lot more places than that, but those are the two obvious ones. So I'm starting to hit the home stretch here. So uh, JavaScript libraries, love them, use them. Uh, we use jQuery a lot, just because it's um, it just eases our path because we're used to it and we've got good um, good processes involved and good patterns that we use. Um, we've used Isotope and Masonry. We've we've tried them out as layout engines. They've got uh, pros and cons, and um, I'm still a big fan. But but you know, use them use them sparingly. Underscore is awesome, and Zach will talk a little bit more about Underscore. Knockout JS, we've we've tried. We haven't used it, but um, but we've we've heard it recommended as a as a really good. Um, is it MVC or MVVM? Is it MVVM. And moment for day format. And these are just a few of the libraries. There's probably literally hundreds of thousands of libraries out there to use. And that's the other nice thing about using Explorer, using a browser as your rendering engine, is that you can then leverage all of the good hard work that people have been putting into getting, getting stuff to, to work. They've been doing it for years, and there's lots of really clever people out there, very, very clever people. 
uh, they test your libraries thoroughly. IE10 is new. Uh, some of this stuff doesn't work perfectly in IE10, so just make sure if it's tested, then you're cool. But just um, just don't expect don't expect miracles straight away. Uh, and most of the libraries, since they're out in the, in the web wild, they probably contain code that means that's, that handles compatibility with multiple browsers, which means there's probably extra overheads that may make them less performant than they, than they should be. That hasn't been the case that we've seen so far, but just be aware of it. Uh, last, last few things is test, test your, your stuff. Optimize your code. It's easy because there's so many things that even, even though I let media queries handle a lot of stuff, you're still having to do some things um, and react to, uh, to, to orientation changes and things. And sometimes the way you set things up, they can cascade. And since JavaScript and IE10 is really, really fast, it can actually hide some of your, some of my poorly written code. Get a slate and test on a touch device. Very important because it is different. Doesn't matter how much you know about using touch devices, actually using it is different from just thinking about how you would use it. Somebody told me this, I can't remember who it was, I think it was Gus actually, that um, if you set your second um, monitor to portrait and then drag between the, uh, drag your app between the first and the second monitor, that's the same as, um, as changing orientation. It's a really simple thing to set up and it makes it really easy to test without having to go through the simulator. The simulator's nice, but I, I prefer it. It seems a little bit faster to actually test apps on a local machine and that lets us test orientation and, and um, resolution changes really quickly. Test your snap view, don't forget about it and do use a simulator for all those other resolutions that you can't get easily on your, on your machine. I just wanted to leave you with one thing that sort of comes from the advertising world, which I've got one foot in sometimes. This idea of a burr of singularity, which, um, which David Ogilvy, who is a very clever man and for an advertiser, he was remarkably clever, it, sort of, it basically says leave, leave people with, with one thing that even though it may be irrelevant, it's one thing that will stick in their mind about, uh, about whatever you're presenting to them. So one thing that they'll take away and they'll just go, that was really done nicely and they didn't have a positive feeling about the thing that, uh, that they were looking at uh, for a long time. Every advertisement that they did for this, uh, for this company had the man with the eye patch and it was never explained why. Uh, thank you very much. And now it's Zach's turn. Hopefully his microphone is all switched Hello. 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 Yep, that sounds like we're on. Can you hear me? Hello? Good? Is that on? Yeah, cool. Yes. Okay. My name is Zach Hitchcock. I'm a senior developer at MV Interactive. I've got uh, 12 years' experience as a software developer. And while at uh, MV, uh, we mostly do web work. And day to day, I do a lot of web work. For me, in the course of my career, I probably have more experience with app development. So starting out with VB6 um, a few years ago, writing ugly VB6 code and making ugly VB6 apps. Then moving on to WinForms when .NET came along. And then in more recent times, doing a bit of WPF and a little bit of Windows Phone 7 with XAML and C Sharp. So today I'm going to talk about my experience in moving from C Sharp to JavaScript. Um, I'm going to talk about the process I went through to learn JavaScript as a programming language. Um, I'll talk about uh, the way we structure our Windows 8 apps um, in terms of uh, programming them with JavaScript. And then finally we'll just talk about some of the tools that we use <coughs> that we've found pretty useful in the short time we've been developing uh, Windows 8 JavaScript apps. But before that, I just want to explain a little bit about XAML at NV historically. Um, so I've got screenshots of two apps that we've developed um, in WPF. The app on the left is an analysis app used by the England and New Zealand cricket teams. And the app on the right is a kiosk app that was used at the Share an Idea campaign in Christchurch soon after the earthquakes to get um, ideas from the public about how to rebuild the city. But Jerry, Jerry Brown is probably going to ignore all of them. Um, so the app on the left, as you can see, it's kind of got general sort of Windows um, elements, the grid view, menu, <coughs> buttons. They all look pretty familiar to a typical Windows app. 
the app on the right has got a, a lot more design to it. It's not your typical Windows buttons and menus um, that's being designed by a designer. So in terms of workflow for us at NV, um, as Sam sort of talked about, our designers don't know XAML and Blend. They're very good at the web stuff, but they don't know XAML and Blend. So in terms of workflow and integration, we either would do apps like the Cricut one there, which don't have a lot of design elements to them, or with the apps that do have a lot of design elements, what we had to do here is the designers would design up the app in Photoshop and then print off a hard copy of that design and write hex codes and widths and heights of boxes, font sizes, a whole lot, and then hand that to us as developers and we would then plug that into the XAML. So hopefully you can see that's not exactly the most efficient way to, to build apps. It meant that us as developers would have to develop the app and then do the integration at the end. Um, so not the most efficient way. So when moving to Windows 8, uh, building Windows 8 apps, we were faced with three choices at MV. We could carry on this, I guess, inefficient way of building apps um, and build them in C Sharp and XAML. Or we could train up our designers to learn XAML and Blend, which would be a perfectly acceptable solution. Or we could build our apps in HTML5 and JavaScript. Um, us as developers would need to learn JavaScript, and the designers can continue using their same skill set, HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. And that's the option we took. So what that meant for us as developers is we had to learn JavaScript. And not JavaScript as in jQuery and DOM manipulation, which up until this point is probably the extent of my JavaScript knowledge, and <clears throat> that wasn't very good. Um, we had to learn JavaScript as a proper programming language. And for me, um, the way I learned it was I basically read the book on the left. Uh, it's called JavaScript, The Good Parts by Douglas Crockford. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's about 100 pages long, so it's not a big 800 page phone book. Um, <clears throat> he basically goes through the syntax of the language and he goes through some of the um, core concepts of the uh, language. There's nothing in there about DOM manipulation, there's nothing in there about the web, it's about JavaScript as a proper programming language. There's a lot of books out there, like the one on the right, um, Teach Yourself JavaScript in 24 Hours, which sounds appealing because that's not a long time to learn something. But if you read that book, I think you would probably, you might learn it in 24 hours, but you might take you another 24 years to unlearn all of the bad mistakes. I'm not totally sure what CSS, forms, and DHTML have to do with JavaScript. But anyway, hopefully the author's not in the room. So other than reading those books, uh, there's some really good stuff on YouTube, again, from Douglas Crockford. Um, he's got a lot of presentations up there that are really good. And other than that, it's just a matter of diving in. So after learning the core syntax of JavaScript and, and starting with some of the concepts of the programming language, <clears throat> to develop Windows 8 JavaScript apps, we needed to come up with a structure for the way that we would develop the apps and a way that we could maintain that workflow between designer and developer. So we adopted the MVVM pattern, the model view, view model pattern which we call NVMVVM because it rolls off the tongue so nicely. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about MVVM. If you're a C Sharp and XAML developer, you'll probably be reasonably familiar with it already. Essentially what it is, it's a separation pattern. It's a way of separating presentation from the rest of the um, logic of the app, the business logic, app logic. So for Windows 8 JavaScript apps, um, the way it works for us is that the view is the HTML, CSS, and templating. And that's really the domain of the develop, uh, designers. So they hang out there um, and they take care of the view. The next layer is the view model. And the view model is just JavaScript objects with properties and functions. And the role of the view model is to organize the model data for display in the view. It takes care for the apps that we've done, we're calling um, APIs. So it takes care of pop, um, calling the APIs and getting the data back. It takes care of caching and polling. So for the cricket apps, we've got live scores up, so we have to keep polling to get the um, updates to the scores. 
And we bind the properties of the, view, uh, of the view model to the view so that they can be presented through templating. And I'll show you a little bit of an example about that uh, soon. In terms of the model, the model are just the um, domain objects for what we're working on. Again, just JavaScript objects with properties. Um, so in the case of the Cricket apps, it's things like series, match, article, um, batsman, bowlers, uh, those sorts of things. So just quickly, I'll just, this is a, um, to show you the project structure in, in Visual Studio um, for how we set up a project. Again, there's CSS folders with CSS images, JS, really similar to a typical web app. Um, us as developers aren't allowed to go inside those folders, so I don't actually know what's in there. You'll have to ask Sam. Um, otherwise, there's, um, what we work in as developers is the models and view models there. And as you can see, um, what I talked about in the last slide, they're the, um, the, like the real world objects that we're um, mapping in the, in the app. So to show you an example from the Crick Info app, uh, this is the home hub of the Crick Info app. And as you can see, we've got uh, a list of a whole bunch of live matches that are currently in progress. We've got a, a whole lot of um, the current series that are in progress and news headlines um, displayed on that page. So in terms of MVVM for us, the view is home.html, which is just a, a HTML5 page. Um, home.js, which takes care of the interaction and presentation of that data and default.css for all the styles. Um, and again, that's what the uh, designers work on. <clears throat> the view model for this page is called home view model. And what that has in it, it's a, a JavaScript file, a JavaScript object. It's got um, a property called live, which is a collection of live matches. It's got a property called series, which is a collection of current series, and a property called headlines. And we just bind those properties to the view to populate that page. And the model in this case is the individual elements, so a live score or an individual series or a news article. So in terms of, again, in terms of workflow between developer and designer, the designers go off, they design the, the page, they build it in HTML. And just to show you an example here, this is a tile from a, representing a live match. So the, the designers have gone off, they've designed their tile, they've coded up some HTML there, put in some static values, and so what we need to do to wire that up to make it um, real data coming through is we um, replace the static, uh, static data with um, the, the names of the properties on the model that's bound to that, um, that view. And we do that there with templating, and there's a whole range of templating options that you can use. So in terms of tools that we've found useful, um, in Visual Studio 2012, um, we use the JavaScript console and DOM Explorer. So with, in terms of web, developing websites, you're probably all familiar with Firebug or the F12 dev tools. Um, when developing Windows 8 apps with um, JavaScript, the JavaScript console and DOM Explorer are really similar to using Firebug and the F12 dev tools. You can mouse over elements on the page and inspect their values to see if the data is getting through that you expect. Um, with the JavaScript console, you can set breakpoints. You can run ad hoc um, JavaScript statements or functions at runtime. Uh, Fiddler. For the apps that we've developed, because we're calling APIs, um, and in some cases third-party APIs, um, Fiddler's basically running the whole time. Um, we can intercept the course of the API, look at the data that's coming back before it gets to our app. And in a lot of cases, it's almost like our documentation for the API. And two, two tools within Fiddler that we use a lot that um, hopefully you'll find useful one is called Composer, which allows you to send GET requests to a URL, or you can be PUT requests or POST, whatever you want. Um, and what we use that for is we'll make calls to the API um, with the Composer, and we can manually put in values into the API. So it's really good for testing. Um, if you want to know what valid um, ranges of values that your API will accept, 
Um, it's really good for stuff like dates. Um, you can put in a range of, try different date formats to see what it will accept and see what comes back when you call the API. Um, the autoresponder, what the autoresponder does is um, for a given call to the API, Fiddler intercepts that call and it never goes off to the server. The autoresponder will reply with data that you um, give to it to reply. So in the cricket apps, what we do there is uh, a, a cricket game is changing state all the time, like there's the first innings and the second innings and all of that. And so we capture that data and then we put it into the autoresponder and so we can um, uh, repeat those different states of the match after the match is finished to, to further test the app and to um, fine tune the design of the app. JavaScript libraries, um, the great thing with developing uh, Windows 8 apps with JavaScript is you can pull in any JavaScript library you want. Um, there's a whole lot out there. Um, pretty much most things have been done in JavaScript already, so you don't have to write a lot of, um, I guess, helper methods um, yourself. There's probably already a library out there. And the one that we use most is underscore.js. Um, when moving from C Sharp to JavaScript, probably the first thing you miss is link um, and being able to write link queries. But by using underscore JS, it's got some, um, a lot of functions in there. They're really similar to, to link queries, um, and there's a whole lot, of, whole lot else. So it kind of eases that pain from moving to C, C sharp to JavaScript. And finally, in terms of JavaScript reference, um, I use the Mozilla Developer Reference website just in terms of um, syntax, I guess, for JavaScript. So I have that open in the browser um, a lot, all the time. So in summary, learning JavaScript, um, it may sound kind of simple, but I recommend going buying that book, JavaScript, The Good Parts by Douglas Crockford. It's a really good book. Um, it will teach you everything you need to know about learning JavaScript as a programming language. Other than that, just dive in and um, write some apps. In terms of structure, use a pattern that works for you. Um, as I've talked about, we use MVVM, but you could use a MVC pattern if you want. There's a lot of uh, libraries out there like Knockout, um, Backbone, that you can um, use in your projects. There's nothing stopping you doing that with Windows 8. You also must be disciplined with JavaScript. Um, it's a weekly typed language. Um, there's no compile time as such. So you're going to find out about your bugs at runtime. So things like coding conventions, um, the way you name things, um, and testing has to be really thorough um, because things can get pretty messy um, pretty quickly. For example, with CrickInfo, we've got 150 tests that we run through before release. We do 150 tests on touch, and we do the same 150 tests on mouse because um, we have to basically cover every aspect of the app. In terms of tools, just quickly, Visual Studio 2012 and Fiddler for debugging, um, real similar to your normal web experience when developing web applications. And the underscore.js library um, is invaluable. And one final thing, for me, learning JavaScript, I, I really feel made me a better C-sharp developer. When, because you don't have that compile time, you end up writing, I guess, defensive code, because you're always checking yeah, what um, the variables pass into your functions. Um, so you kind of start writing your C-sharp code with a more sort of defensive mind. And rather than just writing a whole lot of stuff and running the compiler, you um, just seem to take a little bit more care. So that's it all for our session. Um, there's three sessions here that um, of related content, um, which will probably go into a lot more depth than what we have um, in terms of JavaScript and building Windows 8 apps with HTML and JavaScript, so I really suggest you get along to those. If you want to contact us later, there's our email addresses. Um, otherwise, we'll be just waiting around here. If you've got any questions, please come up and ask. And finally, please fill out the evaluation form. You could win some keyboards or plugs or other cool stuff. <laughs> so thank you all for coming along.